All right, let's take a declaration quickly. One, two, go. As I said to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen and amen. All right, uh, what I want to look at since it's Thanksgiving weekend, I want to look at the subject here of praising God in the light of the things that we have been teaching. And in uh, Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, it tells us that we should arise and shine for our light has come. And then it tells us that darkness shall cover the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and it says, and the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon thee. And then it goes on, and Gentiles shall come to your light, and their kings to the brightness of your rising. And then the next verse tells us in verse 4, lift up your eyes, it says, round about and see. All they gather themselves together and come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Now, it speaks about a very specific time where God's people were asked, or commanded rather, to arise and to shine because their light had come and the glory of the Lord was risen upon them. And when was that time where that commandment was issued? It tells us in verse 2 of Isaiah 60, it says, Darkness shall cover the earth. Isaiah 62. For darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But God told his own people that during that time they should arise and shine. In fact, what he's saying is that darkness that has covered the people cannot and will not be dispelled if his own people don't arise and shine at that particular point in time to dispel the darkness there. And he said, because their light has come, they should arise there and shine. So you can have that light on the inside and you don't allow it. Uh, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Allow that light, all right, to shine before men so they may see your good works and give glory unto your Father who is in heaven. So he says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Uh, so it's a time to arise and shine. It's not a time to be bent backwards and to be beaten down by circumstances in life. It's a time from within to arise and to shine or to demonstrate that light. This is not a time for the child of God to allow the enemy, 
and uh, to allow, right, the world to squeeze you into its own mold there. It is an opportune time, so it says arise and shine during that time. Now, what really does it mean to arise there and to shine? Let's examine it. Go to Isaiah 62 and verse 1. For it says, when you arise and you shine, it says that, all right, when you arise and shine, it says, Gentiles will come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. It then tells you to lift up your eyes, and things are gathering towards you. That's a time of harvest. So let's look at it. Isaiah 62 and verse 1, because as people of God, we have to consciously preach hope, expectation, light, and miracles during this time. We can't allow during this time to begin to preach according to the tide on the outside or else the church sinks. Are you following what I'm saying here? Have to preach light and hope. Say this during the, and it's available, you can listen to it during the webinar there, that it all starts with receiving big ideas and thoughts from God. I know some hours after, I just stumbled on something on the internet, and a woman said, one thing that is common with every billionaire I have interacted with, and said I have access to them. She said, they don't entertain small ideas. That you can come and discuss anything small, all right, with them, right? All they take in and entertain inside their heart are powerful ideas. And this is a time to open yourself up, all right, to God for, for light bearing here, thoughts and ideas. So let's look at Isaiah 62 verse 1 and verse 2. For Zion's sake, he says, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. It says, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Now the next verse. It says, and Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. That Gentiles will come to your light. And all kings your glory. It says, and you are going to be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now, what is in verse 1? Look at what it says here. It says in verse 1, for Zion's sake, will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness, all right, thereof go forth as brightness, as a rise and shine, and a salvation as a lamp that burneth. The effect of it is that Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings will see your glory. Now, what's he talking about? Look at verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 6 and 7 of Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7. I have set watchmen. Now, this is uh, Zion, I will not rest. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace. Now, put verse 1 again. Look at what he says here. Verse 1, quickly. For Zion's sake, Will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Now put verse 6. It says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace. Day or right nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. And give him no rest until he establish 
until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And that verse 8 tells us, all right, about this. The Lord has sworn by his right hand. So he says, I have appointed watchmen that will give the Lord no peace. And the Lord himself will not rest because they are putting pressure on him until, all right, he makes, put verse 6 there, until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth such that Gentiles are now coming to a righteousness and kings are coming to the brightness of her rising. Now, so what are these watchmen doing that are giving the Lord no peace nor rest there until he fulfills this? Now, when they say watchmen, first thing people's minds go into is that these are people that make it in session and, and praying unto God that this. But let's see what he says in the context of Isaiah, what these watchmen are doing. In Isaiah 52 and verse 8, we'll see what the watchmen are doing here. It says, the watchman shall lift up the voice, and with the voice shall they sing. That's why Jesus, when they were singing Hosanna, and some people said, keep quiet, tell them to keep quiet. He says, if they shall all together hold their peace at this particular time, the stones will cry out. So these ones are giving no peace. So what are they doing? And look, I put it back there, Isaiah 52, verse 8. It says there, the watchmen shall lift up their voice. With their voice, they shall sing. In other words, when they arise, what we're going to say is that in arising here, they are giving praise and thanksgiving unto God. That is what they are doing during that time of darkness and gross darkness is that they are beginning, we'll see this, to sing. And they are singing and praising God on purpose and intentionally. And it says that they will sing in verse 8, until for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. The next verse says, break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. So when they were singing, it appeared that they were waste places. For the Lord hath comforted, not that he is going to, he has already comforted and he has already redeemed Jerusalem. To redeem there means to pay the ransom in full. Now you have got to understand this. Everything that God asks you to receive, those things are are not that they are free of charge. Those things have already been paid for and bought by the blood of Jesus. So those things legally are rightfully yours. In other words, it was in his favor and grace that he sent his son to do it. What are we saying here? If somebody buys a property in my name and gives me that property and that property was bought in my name, and the papers are handed over to me, and they are in my own name, that person cannot call that property back because it's now mine. Do you get what I'm saying here? Which means that I can rightfully now go to court, and I can rightfully now use that property, and now use it as collateral for something because it is now mine by right. Now, I didn't work for it, it was the grace of that person that made it my right, but it is now my right. Do you get what we're saying here? So what God is saying here is these things, by the grace of God, he has paid for these things, and therefore you receive them because they are blood-bought. Are you following what I'm saying here? So you, you can demand there. That's why you say I'm giving him no peace because these things have already been paid for. So let's go on here. It says this here. All right. Break forth into joy and sing ye waste places of Jerusalem. Uh, he said the reason is because here you have already been redeemed. 
Everything has already been paid for. So he says, look, arise and shine because your light has already been paid for. He says, darkness may cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but you are the redeemed of the Lord. That's what he said. You have been bought out, all right, of the influence because he says that you have been delivered from the kingdom or from the power of darkness into the kingdom, all right, of who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom, the Bible says, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption means that the ransom has been paid. So if gross darkness is covering the people, you have been bought out of the power of darkness. You don't have to identify with the darkness because he shed his blood so that, and he says, is when you arise, we can dispel that darkness. That darkness will remain until his people arise. Uh, do you get what I'm saying here? It's just like you live in a community here, and inside that community, let's just take this here, no children are going to school, nothing is happening, everybody's in starvation, but your, great -gra your grandfather left billions of dollars for you inside the account. And then you are looking at it, and you are crying with the people that all of us are suffering. And I said, look, use this money to cure this stuff. The only way God is going to show his love to dying humanity is through his own people. And so we have been called to demonstrate that light. So he says this. Let's go on here. He says, break forth into joy, ye waste places. For the Lord has comforted his people and he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bear his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, is what he said. Depart ye out of things. Touch no unclean thing. Go out of the midst of her. Be ye clean, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste, nor by flight, which is in fear. For the Lord will, which means start rejoicing, and the journey begins out of darkness into the light. The God of Israel will be the rear God. Put the scripture back. Will be your rear rewards there. Now, next verse. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And many, now put this in the message translation. Let's look at this. It says, for he didn't, no, verse 13. It says, just watch my servant blossom, exalted, tall, head and shoulders above the crowd. But he didn't begin that way. At first, everyone was appalled. He didn't even look human, a ruined face, disfigured past recognition. Nations all over the world will be in awe and taken aback. All right? Which means that it says nations will be taken aback. But he didn't start that way. So it tells us that he shall deal wisely and he will be prudent. So what's going to happen is that it says, arise there and shine. And as you begin to rejoice and you begin to be thankful and praise God, that light now will begin to come. And then it tells us there in, in verse 13, it says, my servant, verse 13, put it up, Isaiah 52, 13. It says, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted, prudently means wisely, extolled, and he shall be very high. But he begins to deal prudently. You start seeing him make strategic and very wise decisions. 
uh, you begin to see, all right, make informed steps there because the light has now begun. And that's what Gentiles are going to come to. And that's what kings are going to come to, which is the brightness of their rising. It starts making strategic decisions based on deep information that has been given to that individual. Let me explain what I'm saying here. Go to Ezekiel, sorry, um, Isaiah chapter 38. Let me show what I'm saying here, what praise brings to the table. Isaiah 38 here. It says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said, Thus said the Lord, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and you will not live. Now, this is God telling somebody, you will die and you will not live. But then Hezekiah understood that I can still talk to God is merciful. He had turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And he said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. And he prayed to God. Now, because of time, go to verse 7. All right? So he offered his prayer. Oh, okay. Verse 4. Let's look at the answer. All right? And then the word of the Lord came to, to the Lord to Isaiah, saying, so after he prayed, Go and say unto Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord God, God of David thy father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. And then, next verse, And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hands of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Now, verse 7. And this shall be a sign of what I will do. Verse 8. All right, he told him, behold, I'll bring again the shadow of the degrees that has gone and talked about how the son and all of that. Verse 9, what's something? And the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. So this is what he wrote when he was sick and he recovered. So he was telling us the story here. This is exactly what happened. Look at what happened here. Remember, he prayed unto God. God sent uh, Isaiah to come back and tell him that 15 years has been added. So, so hear what he wrote here. All right, put, put it up now. I said in the curtain of my days, I shall go down to the gates of my grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living, which means was thinking death. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of this world, because they told him, put your house in order. My age is departed and is removed. So he had a sentence of death, which means death is coming. I've been cut off like a wizard of my life, he says, and cut me off in pain and sickness. Verse 13. And then he says, I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will, the, will it break all my bones from the day even to night without make an end of me. Verse 14. Like a crane or a swallow, I chatter, I did mourn. My eyes fail while looking upwards. Verse 15. It now says, what shall I say? He had both spoken unto me, himself has done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. Now verse 16. O Lord, by these things men live. And in all these things is the life of my spirit, so thou will recover me and make me to live. He now said, Behold, for peace I had bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption, thou hast cast all my sins behind my back. I hear what he now said. For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Then he said, the living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, because God was ready and God said, I'm going to add 15 years. Once he heard that, he said, therefore, I will sing with my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of my life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs for, and lay it for a plaster and put it on, on the boil and it shall recover. In other words, this is what happened. When God said to, um, to Hezekiah, I've added 15 more years. He said, now, it's not hopeless again, 
God is ready to save me. They have strategic information came. Boil the figs there, place it upon the boil there, and you'll be healed. In other words, the promise of healing, strategic information came. Boil the figs there, place it upon the boil there, and you'll be healed. In other words, the promise of healing was there, place it upon the boil there, and you'll be healed. In other words, the promise of healing was given. He started praising God. The method to get healed was now shown him. Do you get what we're saying here? So it's when a person begins to praise that God now teaches that person the exact thing they are supposed to do to make what he has promised come to pass. Are, are you following what I'm saying here? So let's assume now I'm in business. And God says, I'm going to expand your business tenfold this year. That is a generic promise. Now when I begin to praise him and I arise now, and I begin to shine because my light has come and the glory of God, which means I arise in the place of praise to him there, then that is when I am going to get the strategic insight as to what to do to make this thing go tenfold. It is a generic promise until I begin to rejoice. When I begin to rejoice, that's when I am going to see clearly what I am supposed to do. What he told me is a scripture. What he shows me is the practice of life. Boiling figs and putting it on a boil there is not a scripture. Do you get what I'm saying here? That's a method of getting healed. So if somebody says, one day we are going to, this is what you've got to get. One day we are going to fly. One day we are going to fly. It will remain a hope until you start praising God. God, I thank you because we are flying. Even though there's no plane that has taken off. I rejoice in what you have said to me because now we are flying. Father, I thank you because you have made us to do what? To fly. I praise you for flying. Then you will begin to see how to fly. What you have not praised God for, you can't walk in. And anything you begin to praise him about, all right, that is the very thing that you are going, all right, to walk in. So what does prayer do? Prayer gets us that revelation from God as to what God, all right, has promised you inside that situation. But then you now have to turn away. As Jonah said in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 7, there has to be a prayer and praise connection. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came unto thee into thy holy temple. And God heard the prayer of Jonah. But Jonah now said in the next verse, he said, they that observe lying vanities, in other words, after God has answered the prayer, there will be no change in the condition on the outside. That answer is on the inside of you. Do you get what we're saying here? And it says, if you observe lying vanities, if you say that, listen, why? That's why it says, arise and shine, your light has come. Which way I'm showing this here. In answer to prayer, he gives you the light. And it says that they that observe lying vanities, but they say, Look at my condition. Nothing has changed. You say my prayer has been answered. How come I'm still this way? He says, they that observe lying vanity shall forsake their own mercy. Next verse. He said, but I will sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. This is to arise and shine. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And after you offer that sacrifice of thanksgiving, then comes the manifestation of the salvation. And in this case, he says, my son now will become very prudent in their affairs. Will have unusual insight into things. Will become a right razor, which means we'll start making decisions there. And every step they're taking, they're moving out of darkness into light. Out of darkness into light. And kings are looking and wondering what is going on here. Put the last verse there of Isaiah 52 in King James there, uh, of 15 here. It says this. It says, Isaiah 52, it says, the last verse, please, all right? 
It says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths at him. That which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall. Which means they'll begin to see this person moving in things that kings say that, listen, we didn't have this kind of insight. Where did this person get all this from? It is that rising, that, that thing, the decisions you're making, that is causing that supernatural rise. That's what they come to. That's why in the next verse, in Isaiah 53, verse 1, he said, who has believed my report? To whom shall the arm of the Lord be revealed? It says, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground, which means that you are going to come out of somewhere that looks dry, but because you have believed the report of the Lord and you are praising him for that report, out of that dry ground, they'll see a tender plant. Something impossible will begin to emerge before their eyes. That's why it says, arise and do what? Shine. For thy light has come. Every child of God, you have been bought out of the power of darkness and you have been transplanted into the kingdom of God here. It is now time. It is a strategic insight that you bring that is going to dispel the darkness around. The church is the solution to the world. When we say church, every single believer in their field of endeavor is what will solve the problem. That means Joseph's there in Potiphar's houses who are rising. That's what will solve the problem. Daniel's in the king's court. That's what will solve the problem. In other words, the manifold wisdom of God by every single member of the church there. Are you following what I'm saying? Where rivers of living water are flowing out of the belly of every single person is the, is the solution there. And everybody can begin to tap into it. All right? People don't have to sit down and say, well, you know, uh, what's going on? Uh, you no, know, I know that. People don't have to start rising here. And then begin to demonstrate that. He says, awake. Put on thy strength. All right? Tells us that. I, I believe it's, um, it's Isaiah 51. All right? It says, arise, put on thy strength, O Zion, awake. All right? And it says this. Okay. 51, yeah? Awake, awake, put on thy strength. O arm of the Lord, awake as in ancient of days in Jerusalem. Are thou not he that caught of Rehab and wounded the dragon? All right? And dry the sea. So it says, put on your strength. Arise from the dust there and begin to function. So in closing, how does this happen? Psalm 43, verse 3. Send out thy light and thy truth. So the prayer here was send out. In other words, when Hezekiah prayed, the word of the Lord came to Hezekiah saying, 15 years has been added to your life. Now if you don't arise with that word and start rejoicing in it, that it is done in my life. But you identify still with the symptoms that are in your body, you are never going to find out you have to boil the figs. Do you get what I'm saying here? If I identify with the darkness, I'm not ever going to, even though I've received the promise, and this is where many Christians are at, which means if they ask them about the promise, they can tell you the promise, but they don't rejoice in that promise. And therefore, that strategic insight, when he says, my son will, my servant will deal prudently, and it shall be extolled and be very high, which means that that dealing prudently with that is not there because they identify more with the darkness than with what he has revealed inside. That's why he says, take heed unto that light that shines in a dark place, which is that word, until the day dawns. That dawning of that day means you find out exactly what you're supposed to do now in practice, all right? That's when the day has done, in practice there to make it work. Send out thy light and thy truth. Now, what, what, what is the light and truth supposed to do there? And let them bring me to thy holy hill, to thy tabernacles. Now, what's going to happen there? Then I will go unto the altar of my God. 
unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God. In other words, bring revelation to me of scriptures. The purpose of this revelation. So when Hezekiah turned to the Lord, he turned away and made God alone his source. And God said, fine, I've seen you 15 years has been added. When we turn to the Lord, the veil shall be what? Taken away. Now, once that veil is removed, you see what the scriptures are saying to you about it. Then God demands, he says, I want you to rejoice and thank me for the fulfillment of this particular thing, even though on the outside there is absolutely, there is nothing on the outside. And this has never failed to work. You know, the Bible says that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither are they thankful. So they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts became darkened. All right? Now, if you, once you know God, he gives you his knowledge. He says, because when they knew God, they had contact. They glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, became vain in their imagination. Every innovation starts in the imagination there. He says they became vain and their foolish hearts became darkened. In other words, when you know him as God, if you glorify him as God and you're thankful, then your imaginations there now begins to tend and your heart becomes enlightened. That's when people now begin to see. That's when the business person or that person, that carrier on that job will now by the Holy Spirit perceive and just see some movement there and say, this is exactly what we're supposed to do in this particular situation. Say, how do you know that? Listen to this. That's how the person sees it. That's how the person looks and says, look, we can, we can. This is the translation of promises now, all right, into practical insight in your life as to what to do in a particular situation. And that's because you are praising, which means you are never going to discover how to do something until you have thanked God that he's done. You are never going to find out how to get there until you are praising God that I am already there. Because you have told me that you have given me this, so I'm going to praise you like it is so. And then what happens is you, so it's almost like a chess game here. You offer the prayer, God responds to you with revelation. He says, now create the condition in your life for there to be the manifestation. With that revelation, you make the next move there in praise, and you are right. I'm telling you that there are many Christians that are carrying the word of God through they've heard over years, but they are looking on the outside, and they're as depressed as the world, even though they're carrying that light inside. So he says, arise and shine. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father. In other words, let this revelation in you begin to find expression. So what, why are we singing? Why are we rejoicing? Look. Let, let me ask this, and I'll close with this. Do you think, after God came to meet Hezekiah and said, you're going to be dead, go and set your house in order. And Hezekiah did not pray. Hezekiah just started dancing, I will not die, I will not die. Do, we, do you think, you, you think it will even have lasted in the praise? Once you start dancing, the heaviness of the fact that, uh, do you get what I'm saying here? The heaviness of the fact that you're about to die will overweigh him. What causes people to rejoice is answer to prayer. See what um, David said in Psalm 13 and verse 3. Of, let's start from verse 1. Let, let me do Psalm 13, verse 1. He says, he says, consider, how long will thou forget me, O Lord? Forever, how long will you hide your face from me? He said, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart every day? The more I think about trying to find the solution, the heavier I get. He said, how long is this sorrow going to be? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? He said, only one thing I ask to win this battle. Consider and hear me, O Lord, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He didn't say remove it. He said, God, lighten my eyes. Look at the next verse. He says, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against them, lest those that trouble me rejoice with me. He said, all I'm asking for is lighten my eyes. Now, what does the light of the eyes do? 
in Proverbs 15 and verse 30, it says the light of the eyes, Proverbs 15, 30, causes the heart to rejoice, which means it rejoices the heart, and a good report will make the bones fat. So you can't fake praise where there's no revelation. Uh, do you get what I'm saying here? I mean, I was preaching, uh, I was talking to the word come, and I said this here. You, now, you, you got me seated here now. Let me, let me just give it here. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, if while you are seated here, you hear a sound on your phone, and you take it, I look at your phone, and you see a credit alert of 15000 and comes to 150 million entered your, you know, you know, that alert there changes the conversation in your mind. You know that. If you came with an Uber, your meditation changes because of that information. You now start thinking of which car am I going to buy. You know what I'm saying here. Uh, all right? Now, you don't yet have the car, but your meditation starts changing. Do you get what I'm saying? If it's one billion, your meditation will change. If it's, if it's 20 million, you can't think of buying a house. Do you get what I'm saying here? If it's two billion, you start thinking of a house. Now, you haven't touched the money, you haven't seen the money, but you've seen the evidence that there's money. Your thoughts changes. When God answers the prayer, it causes your thoughts to do what? Change. Are you following what I'm saying here? Your countenance will change. You are not forcing the praise. The light of the eyes causes the heart to do what? To rejoice. So once that revelation comes, your heart now begins to rejoice. And then once you begin to rejoice because you've seen the revelation, it says now the strategic insight on what to do every day. In other words, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do today? As I rejoice, I, my imagination, I pick it up there. As I rejoice, my heart is opened up. As I rejoice, my heart. That's why everything stops when you allow the darkness to come in. That's why Habakkuk, and I'll close with this, he said this. He said, he said Habakkuk 3.17, he said, do all these things happen. Now, now this is why, you, look, there's no other way out until you start thanking and praising God. He says, although the fig tree will not blossom, although all these things will not happen, he says, the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no head in the stall. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will join the God of my salvation. Once that happens, he said, the Lord God is my strength, he will make my feet, which means he will now, you will see that my movement will be different. And it's that difference there, movement there, So to the Christian man who is building something, he actually gets strategic insight. Where after he has built it, if you call him to as a consultant, he will give strategic insight to people as to how things should be done that other people will say, where did you get this insight from? Are you following what I'm saying? They will ask you, from whence have you learned these things? How come these mighty works are being done? Who taught you this wisdom? And it's the Spirit of God that begins to give. So this thing is not, listen, it's not like it's luck. It's not as though the person that then, you know, God cheated. Or, no, 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 no. He pours it on the inside of that person. And one step after another, one step after another, one step after another, he begins to show it here. So folks, let's understand this. You have been delivered from the, you know, you know Jesus told the disciples, said, I will manifest myself unto you, not to the world. Judas looked and said, how is it you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He could understand it. Because when Jesus was around physically, he was man when he manifests himself, even the world will see. Uh, you get what I'm saying here? So how is it you are going to manifest yourself and the world won't see? He says, how is it you will heal and the world won't see the physical? He says, no, I will manifest myself to you. And then you will manifest me to people. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying here? So he will manifest himself into your consciousness. He will manifest himself with real insight into your being. He will manifest himself. Your intelligence will grow. Your this will happen there. It, look, it is not that. It is not that. Let me tell you this. The favor of the Lord is not that. You failed an exam and the boss and the lecturer said, you know, but I like you so I will pass you. The favor of the Lord is that the way and manner in which you wrote the answers, the way in which you passed, the boss looks and says, come, you know, I really like you. 
you are making my job. You get what I'm saying here? It's not that it's a daft person that is liked. It is that a person with unusual insight bringing progress here. There's no boss in this world that doesn't have favor on somebody who is the most progressive in the organization. Uh, you get what I'm saying? That, that's what he's saying here. So don't let's reverse it. That what God is saying in his grace is that we won't be qualified. Then he will pass us. His grace, he's saying, I will make you the most qualified by the intelligence I will give to you. Now, it's a gift I bestowed on the inside of you, but you'll come out as the most qualified. So when people look at you, they'll say you are the most intelligent in the class. You'll say it's by the grace of God because you know how it came. Not that, listen, you are the last, but the grace of God, by the grace of God, they passed you. Uh, are you following what I'm saying here? Somebody comes out as the best pilot in the class. Why are we hiring him? Because he's the best pilot here. Best pilot in his generation. And you say, how come you're the best? Say, by the grace of God. That's why Paul said, I labor more than you all. Yet not I, but the grace of God. But he, he didn't say, I'm lazier than all of you, but the grace of God gave me. He said, I labored more than you all. So if you went to Paul, the work ethic of Paul, nobody could match it. The rate at which Paul was working, no other apostle could match it. And they said, what's going on? He says, it's the grace of God that is at work in me. The might of God that is at work in me. All right? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The grace of God which was bestowed on me was not in vain. But I did what? I labored abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was at work on the inside of me. And whatever you're going to receive grace for, all right? That's why it says those who come up to the throne of grace. That word throne of grace is throne of gratitude. That they might obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So throne of gratitude means they are thanking God for the redemption. So that what he has done will be made evident. How? He passes that light into our minds. And then we begin to act on it. So there are strategic insights here. We said this. When the wind is blowing, Jesus is walking on water. They are strategic. You perceive that particular thing. All right? And that's because you've been singing and praising God for his work. So don't let's make it just a, a weekend of thanking God, but a life of thanking God. Are uh, you following what I'm saying? Which is one of gratitude constantly to the Most High. Because he has already paid. He can't do beyond what he has done. He's paid. And, it's when you, and he bought you out of darkness. So the darkness that covers the earth, he has paid you, bought you out of it. What else will he do? He says, acknowledge that with thanksgiving. And then light starts dropping into your consciousness. And then the ideas begin to come. And those ideas are not just for you. Those ideas are to lighten everybody around you. All right? Because how do nations, peoples, whatever it is, get organizations get out of trouble? Because people inside those organizations supply the strategic information to get them out. Are, are you following me here? How do people get out? They supply the strategic information. It is human beings that supply the strategic information. Human beings. It is Joseph that supplied the strategic information. It was Jacob that supplied the strategic information in Levan's house. Somebody has to supply that information. And he says, if you are my child and children of light, then that strategic information should be yours. And you can't wait for one person. You do it in your own field. Do you get what I'm saying? You do it. That, it's a culture, which means wherever I am, I'm not here to take. I'm here to bless. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. And by the power of your spirit, as this truth takes deep root within our consciousness and brings forth massive fruit in our lives in the mighty name of God. Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, next Saturday, please, for those in Lagos area, will be a workers meeting. That's March 9th. All right. At, um, what time do we start? 8 a.m. All right. 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. All right, then. All right, the registration links will be sent, so please register. God bless you all.